Hello, welcome to Relational Knowledge, uh, Centering Community Voices. This is the fourth webinar of the Grounded Knowledge Project, and I am Tiffany Pewitt, the Executive Director of the Institute for Diversity and Civic Life. Uh, we're really glad that you're joining us today. We have um, a really excellent uh, set of conversations ahead of us. The way that we're organizing this webinar today is through uh, two separate conversations that will then kind of come together for a larger conversation um, with the whole group. So um, with those conversations will be first between uh, Farina King, um, Raylan Butler, and Midge Dillinger, who are going to um, talk about their experiences working together on an oral history initiative through the Muscogee Creek Nation. And then we'll have Henry Goldschmidt, uh, Ia Oloriwa and Mohan Ramaswamy talk about how they've worked together on uh, religious literacy and educational initiatives through the Interfaith Center of New York. So we're really excited for these conversations and I will turn this over to Farina. Uh, yeah, thank you. Um, Mado, <laughs> thank you to uh, Raylan Butler and Midge Dillinger for joining us too. And Tiffany for that introduction in Navajo, we introduce ourselves in our language, Dene Bazad, through our clans. And so I'll do that um, just to give a little background to myself and how I came to know Midge and Ray Lynn and excited then to talk to them as we have all this short time, you know, I could talk on and on with them. So briefly, I'll introduce myself. Uh, so I just, you know, say that to recognize my kin. That's how we share where our families are from. My mother is white settler, American uh, descent, and I'm born for the towering house and black street woods people of Diné, as Navajo call ourselves. And uh, Midge Dillinger is who I met first of these two when I was a professor of Cherokee and Indigenous Studies affiliate and history department uh, associate professor at Northeastern State University in Tahlequah. And Midge was working on her American Studies master's degree and then went on to work with Raylan Butler with the her nation, Muscogee Creek Nation, in oral history specifically, and Raylan Butler has played a significant role with um, tribal historic and heritage preservation wor work, and now has a distinguished title as an acting secretary of, I believe it's culture and humanities um, in Muscogee Creek Nation and has worked on various projects with different components, whether it's oral history or others. And I think this overarching theme of the conversation today being how to center on community voices is so crucial, foundational to the work that Ray Lynn and Midge do. And so without further ado, I, um, you know, a, a quick sentence background here, and then we'll turn time to hearing from Midge and Ray Lynn, is that recently we have collaborated on an edited volume. It's a work in progress about COVID-19 in Indian country. And um, Midge and Ray Lynn worked on an oral history project with their people and community um, of Muscogee experiences of COVID-19. And it just really was eye-opening of how these kind of collaborations with community, when you have a, a native nation, specifically Muscogee Creek Nation led oral history project, how, how does that work? You know, what are their insights from that? And then when you're trying to collaborate and connect with academics, what are some challenges, ins and outs to that? So these are the questions we'll be uh, going through today, see if we can. So to start off, um, Midge and Ray Lynn, we'd love to hear more about your work in historic and cultural preservation with the Muscogee uh, Creek Nation. I know I gave you know a little background here, but what do you want to emphasize to listeners, the audience today, people trying to learn about how to center on community voices? And um, it's up to you. Maybe uh, we can you know, 
either Raylan, start with Raylan and then to Midge if you're good with that. And then next time, switch that around. Want to go ahead, Raylan? Sure. Mado, Farina. Uh, Raylan Butler, Jaho Jivkidos. Is it echoing? Sorry. Okay. Raylan Butler, Jaho Jivkidos, Amalegida, Wakogi, Almadowa, Pakantalahasi. Uh, similar to Farina, I introduce myself by my clan and my tribal town. That also is a way that we um, find relation and um, to one another in the Muscogee community. Um, I do, wanted to mention a little bit, um, I'm the Secretary of Culture and Humanities now, so I've been acting for, for about seven, eight months, and so I'm glad to be the official um, title. It's a new division at the Muscogee Creek Nation, our tribal government, where um, we have all the cultural and language programs under one umbrella and have an executive um, leadership position, you know, at the cabinet level um, to help with the administration and bring some uh, real focus on cultural projects. And so, um, but for the last nine years, I've worked in the historic and culture preservation department. And our mission is to um, preserve all important aspects of Muscogee culture, history, language, um, and you know cultural resources. So that can be protection of sacred land, sacred sites. Um, we are a removed tribe. We're originally from the southeastern United States of Alabama and Georgia, uh, Florida, North Carolina, South Carolina, Tennessee. Um, but in the 1830s, during the Indian force removal, um, we were relocated to Indian Territory in Oklahoma, where we're at today. And so a lot of the work that we do is dealing with protecting important places and sites in our history, in our homelands, um, but also here on our reservation in northeastern Oklahoma. Um, we also have our National Library and Archive, which Midge will talk a little more about. Um, but then we also do archaeology work um, here you know, on these lands that we are currently occupy. And then we um, do NAGPRA work. So we do a lot of repatriation. NAGPRA is a Native American Graves Protection Repatriation Act where uh, tribes, uh, fairly recognized tribes have a right under the law to get items that have been at museums or uh, human remains that have been excavated and or cultural items that are at museums and institutions um, that we repatriate them and rebury them back to where they belong. And so we, we do quite a bit of work um, in that realm, but uh, thank you and happy to be here today, Mado. Thank you, Raylan. How about Midge? Uh, other thoughts to add to giving people a background of, of the work you do? Yeah, hello everyone. Uh, it's Jay Midge Dellinger, Joe Jipidos. Uh, so I'm a Muscogee citizen and I'm the oral historian for the Muscogee Creek Nation. Uh, and as Farina has already shared, uh, Farina and I began our work together with uh, me as student and her as professor and, and mentor. Uh, I, I owe um, really everything that I, I'm doing uh, career-wise to Farina. She introduced me to oral history as a graduate student. Um, I didn't know the first thing about oral history back in 2016 uh, when I started my master's work but very quickly uh, fell in love with the work, saw the significance of it, and knew that it was work that I wanted to do here uh, with Muscogee people. And, uh, and you know, Ray Lynn at that time, while I was in school, was the manager uh, of the department here. And we began having conversations about bringing um, this work into the Muscogee Creek Nation and, and really focusing on establishing an oral history program um, here at the Muscogee Creek Nation. Of course, you know, there, there have been those before me who have, um, who have done this work. And um, so now we are, you know, truly focused on establishing a, a program and uh, creating some longevity here with this work. And so I have the, um, the honor and, um, well, the honor to do this work and, and to work with our people here at the Muscogee Creek Nation, uh, which if you know folks don't know, uh, the Muscogee Creek Nation Reservation is located uh, in Northeastern Oklahoma. So we're coming to you from Oklahoma today. Um, but yeah, so at the core of my work here 
at the Muskogee Nation as a tribal historic preservationist um, is gathering through the process of Western oral history methodology. So recording, sitting down with Muskogee citizens and, and doing recorded interviews and gathering our people's um, oral traditions and histories um, our stories and knowledge and, and teachings mm -hmm. so that we can um, keep those uh, and uh, in longevity for our future generations. I also um, have opportunity to do other types of historical research work and some of my other um, historical topics of interest and research are indigenous boarding school histories mm -hmm. as well as the um, civil war in Indian Territory, which is a historical topic that has really um, been overlooked by um, academics and historians um, throughout time. And so that's important work uh, that I do here at The Nation. And so I'll go ahead, Farina, and, and, and stop there and just kind of give that brief explanation of, of what I do here. Yes, there is so much that both of you do. And thank you, you know, for this. Um, it can be really hard work and so important. Um, and as you both were mentioning, you know, you've done different collaborations with academics, right? Academia being work for educational purpose, knowledge, you know, all, all these areas and fields that that people talk about, archaeology, history, archives. Uh, oral history. Um, so a question here is, how have you connected your community-based work? And I know, you know, how crucial, how how important, you know, it's just everything to be working with and for your people. How do you connect that work with academics, uh, especially Native American studies? Because um, there can be a lot of these different fields and they have their own ins and outs dynamics to them. And you can talk about that too, but I, I was interested as well of Native American studies or Native American studies adjacent academics and, and the work you've done. Uh, Midge, do you want to go ahead and then we'll hear from Ray Lynn? Okay. Um, so I do quite a bit of work um, with our local university here, um, the University of Tulsa which is a private um, institution of higher education. And I've had the opportunity over the last four and a half years to really develop a relationship um, with some of the folks there at that university and um, in both the history department and the English department. Uh, and so interestingly, you know, my first engagement with them uh, was with a couple, it well, and still is because this project is still ongoing, the Presbyterian School for Indian Girls Project, which is a boarding school project um, that was created by one of these, uh, one of the professors in the English department there at the university. And, um, you know, Farina, you were actually, again, a part of that and at the beginning of this relationship because this uh, professor, Dr. Laura Stevens, reached out to you uh, to ask you, okay, how do I go about making a connection with the Muscogee Nation, um, wanting to start this project that focuses on this school that was attended predominantly by um, Muscogee girls and young women. I want to engage the Muscogee Nation in this project. And, and of course, then you gave her my name and that's how that relationship began. And, and it's been a fantastic relationship um, that I've had with these professors and the students who over the last four and a half years have volunteered to research um, on this very significant project. And um, what's interesting about this history is that the Presbyterian School for Indian Girls is the predecessor school to the University of Tulsa. And it's a history that has been swept under the rug. It's a history that has not been shared. It has not been taught. Um, the university, you know, for all these decades has not put that history front and center. Um, to their school history. And so now we have been um, doing that and uh, not only sharing the history with the public, but also more specifically finding the names uh, of girls and young women who attended the mm -hmm. school. And um, we are now in the, in the process of doing biographies uh, on these young women uh, and girls 
And we've this year been able to create a beautiful website. Um, but all of this we've done collaboratively. Freen, were you gonna say something? Um, no, I mean, I I just think that's really awesome how you've done this, you know, I guess both of you, as you're answering this to something to talk about too, is like, well, why connect with the academics and what are some possible, like in terms of benefits, but also the challenges too. Yeah. That I'll circle back. Did you want to wrap up your thought there? Yeah. Well, I mean, I, I can respond to that too. Um, you know, what I want to say is, first of all, it's, it's very unusual for someone in the academic world or really anyone outside of us, outside of the Muscogee Nation, to take that initiative, um, to, to, to reach out to us and say, hey, we want you to be a part of this project. This is your history. Uh, we want you to be a part of this project. And that's absolutely what um, these professors at Tulsa University have done. And so that's at the core of, of everything that, that we do. You know. My, my uh, position in this project is as a liaison, tribal liaison, and I help with the research too, but I just wanted to point that out that that, you know, when that happened back in 2020, uh, that was a fantastic thing. And I thought, wow, they're coming to us um, with this project that, that, that they wanna do. And so, um, and so the benefits of, you know, us working on this project together is, you know, the fact that we are um, finding this history, researching this lost history. You know, this is Muscogee history. This is Tulsa University history. Uh, it's Indian Territory history, Indigenous boarding school history. Um, but it's been a lost history. And uh, together, we've been able to bring this, you know, history to the surface, surface and give it the light, uh, as well as the lives of these Indigenous girls and young women, um, acknowledging them and honoring them. Um, as they should have been done decades ago, uh, but uh, we're doing it now, and that's the important thing. And and so that's you know that's what so the project itself is beneficial to to both of us, um, obviously, and it's beneficial to Muscogee citizens, you know, to the non-Muscogee public. Um, and so I, I'm looking when I'm looking down. I'm sorry, I'm looking at the questions. Um, I have the questions in front of me. Uh, yeah, so I'll I'll just stop there with that project, but obviously I have a lot more that I can talk about, but I'll give Raylan a chance to uh, chime in here. Yeah, sounds great. Raylan. Okay. okay, thank you. So in the work that I've been doing, um, you know, partnering with academia has been something I feel is very important for the Muscogee Nation to do, um, mainly because, you know, as a graduate student, um, I felt really disconnected and as a native student in a program that um, really encouraged us to incorporate native knowledge or, you know, parts of your research to include your native community. What, what they didn't really understand about the challenge of that is that just the nature of academics or even the nature of science sometimes is really invasive and can be disrespectful to tribal knowledge and tribal ways and values. And so bringing those together, you know, ha is a challenge, but I, I definitely see why it's needed and um, the importance of it in that our voice has been missing from the, the research. Um, primarily, my collaborations have been with archaeologists um, and historians. Uh, I attended an archaeology meeting in the southeast, and it's a premier um, society there where there were um, 700 archaeologists who studied in Alabama, Georgia, Florida. And um, I went to a whole session that was on the Muscogee Creek Nation, and we had not been notified that the session was happening. We had no idea that the 10 papers presented there by those uh, researchers were that that research was happening. Um, people had written books about our tribe and never even talked to us. And so at that moment, I knew we, we got to fix this because um, the work that we primarily do are with federal agencies and other uh, federal land managers in the Southeast and, and under National Historic Preservation Laws, 
there's a requirement to consult with uh, descendant communities. And so um, when it's a federal project and you want to build a new road on the national forest, you got to consult with tribes. And so we know about those kind of projects. But when you're in academia and you're a graduate student and you're doing a research project, you don't there's no requirement to reach out and consult uh, with those communities. Um, unless you're dealing with living subjects and you have to go through an IRB process and ensure that, you know, that there's ethical uh, considerations for that. But what we learned is that people have been studying our ancestors in their graves and their grave, the things they were buried with and writing books about them without ever talking to us. And it was really eye-opening for myself. And I realized that I'm going to attend that meeting every year and um, I want to start meeting as many people who are who might be open to collaborating with us because the the real the reality is is that the stories that they were telling and narratives that they were telling come from a, such a, a colonial context of what was written, you know, um, at the historic time, which is at contact. And for us, that's 1540 when Hernando de Soto came through and his writings are the first things that people acknowledge that our people exist. And so though they're not all true or correct. And then people also in that field, they're saying, hey, these things are a thousand years old. How could you possibly know anything about them or these mound sites, monumental structures? You guys are living modern lives now. And so they completely just disconnected us. And so a lot of the progress we've made has been to collaboratively work together on active research projects um, regarding archaeology. We've actually assisted with field work to collect the data. Um, and, and, and one of the, you know, the good out, the outcome of the academic side too is, um, is access. We don't have access to peer reviewed journal publications because we're not students <laughs> and we don't purchase that license. So uh, partnering with um, the University of Georgia, UGA has been one of the biggest partners um, that I've worked with. They, they allow us access to those kind of materials. Um, but then also, I'm not an archaeologist by trade, um, but have been co-authored on papers and uh, academic publications in uh, pretty, pretty um, you know, top tier archaeological journals, um, which is, you know, pretty neat because I would, if I would have wrote a paper myself, they would have never accepted it. But because it's in partnership with the, the academic institutions, it also um, gives priority to our knowledge and our native ways of knowing, which is all the time overlooked, you know, um, and is why a reason I went to graduate school is because, you know, I've seen sacred sites be desecrated um, because, you know, we have prayer people or, or um, cultural people, bear, knowledge bearers who say, hey, this is a sacred site. This is very special, important. But if a scientist didn't say it or somebody with a PhD didn't say it, they don't care and they get overlooked and those voices are are diminished. And so as a Muskogee nation, as a sovereign nation, we're having our hands out, wanting to partner with academic institutions to tell a better story, to tell a fuller story, to have mutual benefit for both communities. You know, for too long, people have come and taken knowledge from our community and never returned and benefited by getting PhDs and by, you know, excelling in academia. And so we just, we're not saying that, you know, the whole process is bad. We're just saying that we can make it so much better and don't leave us out. This is our history and we have a voice and we still want to participate. And so we're working on creating an IRB process here at the Muskogee Nation so that researchers have a clear understanding of what is expected and what we and, and hope to have um, and, and mainly sharing the final product. A simple thing is sharing <laughs> your, your information back with the community is a big deal that hasn't been done consistently. Wow. Thank you, Mado. Thank you so much for that. I think both of you really hit it on the nail, you know, just hit on target there with um, overall these conversations about grounded knowledge. Um, it's also ethics and knowledge of just the fact that 
um, those who produce the knowledge in forms of publications or what academia recognizes as, you know, education with the capital E or um, knowledge with the capital K, you know, like uh, these kind of definitive, how, how can it be possible that they write about a people and they don't even know them? They really don't even know them or their descendants, even if it is the ancient ones or ancestors or things like that. But if they don't know the people that these histories and experiences have directly affected, that that knowledge is from those peoples and their ancestors, and you don't even talk to them. It's not just about centering the community voices. It's, it's ethically like, what is the way to know things and spelling it out like that, I think was very, very powerful. So thank you for the work you do. Uh, Tiffany, I know we're going to transition now to hear um, a couple, uh, some more uh, speakers with us. And I look forward to us circling back and, and talking together in, in the big overarching question for today. Thank you, Raylan. Thank you, Midge. We'll be um, coming back around. Thanks. Thank you. Um, that was really fantastic. So it was really great to hear from all of you. And um, I'm excited for when we later in the webinar, we all come back and talk together. Um, and so now we will shift over to Henry Goldschmidt, who will lead our next conversation. Thank you, Tiffany. It's really a pleasure to be here. <clears throat> um, and I'm, oh, I'm delighted to be joined by Ialarisha Ama Aloriwa. Um, and I think joining in a moment, um, Ramaswamy Mohan. Hi, guys. Uh, my pleasure. Let me just introduce myself very briefly, and then I'll say a bit about the work that I've um, had the pleasure to do with um, Ia Oloriwa and, and Mohan over the years. Um, so uh, I'm Henry Goldschmidt. I'm the Director of Programs at the Interfaith Center of New York. Um, so I've come from a slightly different institutional setting than Farina a moment ago. Um, I, I am an academic, kind of, <laughs> but I'm no longer full-time in academia. Uh, I'm a cultural anthropologist by training, and then I taught uh, in religious studies for a number of years at Wesleyan University in Connecticut. Then I've worked at the Interfaith Center of New York uh, since 2010, which is a small, kind of scrappy, uh, community-based nonprofit organization. Um, but I still consider myself an academic, maybe, or at least a scholar in a, some sense of the word, um, working at a nonprofit. Um, so one of the many things that I do at ICNY is um, community-based religious diversity education programs, which is a fancy way of saying, uh, you know, bringing groups of K-12 teachers and students, and sometimes university students, but usually K-12, um, bringing groups of teachers and students to visit houses of worship all around New York City, and also facilitating conversations between those students and diverse religious leaders. Um, it's a way of, of doing classroom teaching essentially in a, in a, with a community-based experiential um, and collaborative pedagogy. Uh, and what's exciting to me at least about this work is that it brings together the perspectives of academics, you know, myself and, and others, um, K-12 teachers, and faith community leaders, you know, and I think that bringing those perspectives and methods together gives students a much richer sense of religious diversity and the role of religion in civic life than they would get, you know, from any one of those perspectives alone. So I'm 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 thrilled to be joined today uh, by two faith community leaders who are you know longstanding friends and and partners in this kind of work. Um, I'm looking forward to hearing their thoughts. Just let me introduce folks very briefly. Um, first, uh, I'm happy to be joined by Ia Larisha Ama Aloriwa, um, who is a Lukumi priest um, and the founder of the Egbe Iwa Rites of Passage program. Aloriwa, I hope I'm pronouncing that like close yeah, enough to. Okay. <laughs> um, but anyway, Egbe Iwa is a, is a youth development and cultural mentoring program that served diverse young New Yorkers, teens and young adults since 2002. Um, and uh, Ia Oloriwa and I have worked together over the years, mostly on, on panel discussions that bring, you know, groups of religious leaders, um, either from 
her specific faith tradition or like, you know, multi-faith panels from a range of faith traditions, bringing folks together to talk with teachers or students or social workers or other folks. Um, I should also just mention just brief bit of uh, religious diversity knowledge. <laughs> Ia Larisha is her uh, title as a female Lukumi priest um, or Ia for short. Um, so Ia Oloriwa, thank you so much for being here. Um, second, oh, and you know what I'll do is I'll I'll put a slightly longer bio for Ia Oloriwa in the chat. And for folks who may be watching this, you know, on YouTube or another platform later, we'll, we'll uh, you know, look down the screen and we'll have bios there. Um, uh, second, I'm delighted to be joined by Ramaswamy Mohan. Um, who is a member of the Board of Trustees and also a religious school teacher at the Hindu Temple Society of North America, um, otherwise known, most New Yorkers know it as the Ganesh Temple in Flushing, Queens. Um, it's the oldest and largest Hindu temple in New York. Uh, and Mohan and I have worked together over the years, mostly on um, site visits, bringing groups of students or teachers uh, to the Ganesh Temple for a very brief introduction to Hindu community life. Um, so Mohan, or one, people in the community would often say Mohan uncle, just as a term of <laughs> respect. Uh, Mohan uncle, I'm so glad that you could be here. And I'll also put a slightly longer bio in the chat for folks. Um, so I, I wanna just turn things over to Mohan and Alori while like, as soon as humanly possible, but just very briefly to set the stage, just want to say, like, speaking personally, I have to say, like, I was pretty nervous <laughs> when I first reached out to them, I mean, years ago now, about collaborating on the Interfaith Center of New York's um, education programs. Um, and I still am a little nervous. I've been doing this kind of work for many years now, but I still am a little nervous about building relationships with faith community leaders and wanting those relationships to be as respectful and reciprocal as possible. Um, I'm very aware of the history of academic misrepresentation of the Hindu and Lukumi tradition, um, very much like what Ray Lin was saying earlier about the kind of complicated relationship between academics um, and Native American communities where, you know, academia, can sometimes be an invasive or, or disrespectful uh, presence in, in local communities. Um, I came into this work very conscious of those issues, which doesn't mean I've always navigated them <laughs> perfectly, but I'm, I'm very conscious of those concerns. Um, and I've tried over the years to build, as I said, respectful and reciprocal relationships with the faith leaders that I've worked with. Um, and I, I gradually came to kind of realize or to, to see over the years that the religious leaders that choose to collaborate with the Interfaith Center of New York, frankly, like they have their own compelling and profound reasons for joining us in this work. Um, they've got their own agendas that they're trying to pursue through their relationship with me and the Interfaith Center. And those, those you know, their motivations may be somewhat different from my own, but, but similar enough that there's, you know, really important room for collaboration. Um, so it's that kind of collaboration that I wanna talk about today. We have about 20 minutes. I will, <laughs> I will uh, stop talking myself um, and turn this over to Mohan and Aloriwa. Um, I guess maybe starting with you, um, Ia Oloriwa, can you say just a little bit more in general about your experiences doing um, education programs about your faith community, whether it's with you know me and the Interfaith Center or maybe with other organizations that you've partnered with, you know, and I guess just to be really blunt, like what's in it for you? <laughs> <laughs> why why have you personally and and your community chosen to prioritize this kind of work like what motivates you in these public education programs you know ethically or spiritually or or just personally it's um interesting to um to be a part of this group so thank you first of all for inviting me um and i was as i was listening to the earlier speakers um it speak, I was feeling directly in answer to your question, which is that 
we as human beings have much more in common than uh, than we than not. Um, many of the struggles um, that were spoken of today are the same struggles um, that I deal with. And um, it's been a very pleasant experience to work with you, Henry, um, and be part of these conversations because it's necessary to show up. It's necessary to show up. It's necessary to make sure that, that your voice is heard so that when we talk about centering communities that we are part of the focus that is centered on, you know, um, it's it's uh, been this notion of uh, having to hide and uh, uh, feeling of not being accepted by society that uh, we've had to struggle with over, you know, since enslaved Africans were brought to uh, to the to uh, this side of the world and also in 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 Africa. So the uh, reasoning for joining you, joining these discussions is to show that there is camaraderie, also to feel camaraderie, not for me personally, not to feel isolated, and also mm -hmm. to let people know that we do have common struggles and we also have common successes. Um, so everything that I've done with you through these panel discussions has been very uplifting, very positive. I've met some amazing people. I can't wait. So we have the group uh, discussion at the end because I was taking notes um, that I want to speak about on um, some of the points that were made. So, mm. um, and then I, uh, one other short thing I wanted to say is I've said to you and um, Uncle Mohan um, in our discussion earlier is um, I, I really believe that God moves us in ways that we don't even understand. And so I am a very, very faithful woman. Um, I move as spirit tells me to move. I'm, I move as I'm uh, uh, given advice by divination to move, uh, whether I understand it or not, <laughs> whether I feel I have time, time for it or not. Um, and now that I am an academic, hey, uh, <laughs> just received my BA. I'm now working on my master's um, and I'm seeing uh, another side of the struggle within academia. Um, two yeah. of my Three grandchildren uh, have been uh, initiated uh, earlier th this year, and I'm seeing the struggles that they're experiencing still in the K through 12 world that all of these things still need to be addressed. So I have to be part of these discussions. Yeah, thank you. And let me ask you a quick follow up. And I apologize, Mohan, I promise we'll get to you in a moment. But uh, Alora, I'm just wondering what you're saying before about the need to be present, to show up, to be part of the conversation. I don't want to oversimplify this too much, but I imagine that that has a pretty, that has a unique or, or distinctive importance in your case, coming from a faith tradition that frankly is not often even recognized as part of the landscape of religious diversity in New York. I mean, again, not, not, to prioritize one person, but like everyone at least knows of the existence of Hinduism. They might not know anything about it, or they might have only know what, you know, British colonialists tell them about it, but they've at least heard of it. The Lukumi right. tradition and the other African diaspora traditions, I mean, there's hundreds of thousands of New Yorkers from these traditions, but often it's just below the radar. So oh, does we're, that- we're, we're known, but we're known in, in a very stereotypical uh, prejudicial way, you know, everything that is associated with African tradition, you know, it brings up uh, memories of Tarzan and, you know, dart throwing and, and uncivilized savages, you know, um, and so we get lumped together under this insane umbrella, um, which certainly, of course, is not the truth. Um, but yeah, it's 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 uh, not been recognized. I remember one of the uh, uh, breakfasts that I went to um, that the mayor uh, was having. I forget which mayor it was. Um, but anyway, he called everybody from the different traditions up on the stage. And I was like, hello, hey, <laughs> you know, and there was no representation. And I wrote several letters in the following year there was. So, you know, we have to show up and we have to let people know that we're here. Yeah. Ashe. Um, Mohan, let me uh, turn to you now and just the same kind of 
general question, if you could say a little more about your experience doing education programs. I know I'm not the only person who brings groups of school kids to visit the Ganesh Temple. You have like a regular traffic of school kids. And just for yourself personally or for the temple, like what what's in it for you? Again, not to be crass about it, but why have you chosen to prioritize doing this kind of public education work? Uh, I, I have been uh, in education focusing mainly on religious studies for the past 25 years. And prior to that, I mean, I, I was full-time in financial executive in Wall Street and all that stuff. So two different lives, basically speaking, completely incongruent. <laughs> uh, and uh, I enjoyed this. This made, felt, personally, it made me a more complete person. And mm -hmm. today I sit here and I, I'm so glad I'm here because I hear the common denominator among all the four speakers is being misunderstood. Yeah. But it's kind of uh, misunderstood from the point of view of faith, and then you categorize them in a particular way because of it, and so on and so forth. And uh, it is kind of shameful that there are one billion Hindus in the world and still misunderstood in spite of all this. And that is part, part mostly because uh, there's, there was foreign invader, foreign domination uh, of in history of about 800 years. So, and the most recent being uh, English-speaking British colonialists and their interpretation of the faith, the culture, the tradition is what is known throughout the world. And slowly but sure, and 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 the, uh, now we are we are slowly but uh, surely. Uh, one thing, one one family at a time. We are educating, particularly the. We start with. Uh, we found out that uh, the, the groups that visit the temple, which had increased ever since Henry came into the picture in 2010, <laughs> particularly from interfaith, and uh, Henry is uh, downplaying his interaction with us. He once organized interfaith debate among teenagers, high school students. Uh, from many, mostly East Asian, uh, Eastern faiths, but there, probably there was also a, a, a Jewish faith is also was one of them. Anyway, uh, that was unbelievable experience for the students. And since that time, whatever Henry may think, he's one of us. <laughs> he's one of the one of us. Uh, but there is some uh, selfishness on our part because the kids that are born for parents that are born in this country, the parents themselves know very little or misinformed based on the British books. Mm -hmm. And so therefore the tradition has not been passing on and uh, passing on. So they will be friends with, they will be friends with all the other 99% of the population of their peers. And if we educate them, then we have a better chance. And then when they hear from adult, some from some adult, telling them who's supposedly a little bit more knowledgeable, telling the same thing to the group that they have heard from their friends, even if one or two of them say, oh, 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 that is the real story. And then we say, that is good enough for a guy like me. If, I, if, if you can't change your whole group, you change one person at a time, mm. inform one person at a time. Mm. So the, actually you can't change anybody. The only person you can change is yourself. Nobody else you can change. Mm. So that that is why I do this. Yeah, thank you, Mohan. And I, I ultimately, I think I agree. You know, you can't change anyone else. You can only change yourself. But as educators, we try to give students the opportunity to like be in a place or in a relationship that allows them to change themselves. And if I, I may, like, if I may add yeah. to that, the education that I get, we get from the academics, when we change ourselves, we are making an informed change right. about what, what in myself. Right, right, right. But to me, the, the, the real deep importance of the kind of education programs that we three have collaborated on. So I just don't feel like students aren't going to change in a, in a deep ethical way by learning textbook knowledge about religious diversity. You can read all you want about, you know, X, Y, or Z from the Hindu or Lukumi faith. And even if it's accurate, even if it's like 
subtle and accurate. If it's just on the page of a world religions textbook, it's not going to change people in their hearts. But but actually meeting community leaders on a panel discussion or visiting a site like the Ganesh Temple, that has more of a power, I, I hope, to create change. Um, one of the things, though, I want to, another question I want to flag for you, or issue I want to flag for you guys, one thing that that honestly makes me a little nervous about these kinds of, you know, community-based experiential programs is I'm always worried that students, especially younger students, sometimes we're working with middle school kids, <laughs> and as a parent of a middle school kid myself, I can tell you they're a complicated bunch. Um, I'm worried that students, when they visit the Ganesh Temple or speak with, you know, religious leaders, are going to have a kind of voyeuristic or even like dehumanizing experience that they'll, they, they visit the temple and they just kind of treat it as like a spectacle or like, who are these you know, weird people? Um, what I want them to do is to see the temple and or religious leaders that they speak with as, you know, neighbors and teachers. Um, but I, it doesn't always work out that way necessarily. So I don't know. Do you guys do you share that concern? And have you ever felt like Mohan when groups come to visit the temple? Have you ever felt that kind of like voyeuristic or just disrespectful vibe from students or teachers that you've worked with? And you can be honest if any of the students that I brought have, have, have brought right, in way. Actually, as usual, it is 99, in this case, 99.9% .9 positive experience. Where there's always a couple of things that come to mind. A couple of students have stayed outside of the temple because their families have told them not to go inside. So uh -huh. we respect that and uh, in several groups, which is fine. We make sure that they are comfortable. If it's summertime, they're sitting in a cool place. That I mean, cold, I mean, they're not like frying out in the street. The uh, the the second is the teachers are always respectful, always curious, always always asking questions, uh, and it's remarkable because they have been taught X about Hinduism, and here this guy is sitting here telling them why, <laughs> why as in starts with the letter Y. So uh, and. Again, a remarkable hats off to the academics. There's only one case where I was not the tour. My, actually, my wife was uh, the person who was giving the tour. It was 15 years ago or so. Uh, and as she was give, explaining our theory of who is God and what is God, the professor uh, told, told them, told the student, the teacher told the students at the end of my presentation, uh, her presentation, told, told them, so she says, me, mm -hmm. meaning that don't believe a word of what you're saying. So mm -hmm. there's always going to be one because that person's, we as, as Hindu, we attribute the, that to that's all they know. Mm. So we walk away saying, because you're going to tell, other, otherwise that person's going to be living in your head rent free, <laughs> thinking right. about him negatively. So, so yes, 99.9% right. .9 positive. Right. Sorry. Go ahead. Oh, interesting. No, no, thank you. And yeah. Laurie, what? Well, same, same general question. Have you ever? Oh, interesting that you say that because <laughs> one of the things that um, I, I, I sense from from Uncle um, and and everyone that's spoken today is, you know, we're all really open. Yeah. We're not the ones with the problem. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like we're, <laughs> we're like, okay, you don't believe this? Fine. What do you? You know, it's it's a really difficult thing for many people to find their way to God, right? Not everyone is raised in the faith. And even those that are raised in the faith may have issues with the faith that they're raised in. So a lot of people struggle to figure out, you know, what path that they want to take. So for us, oh, you found something that works for you? Yay. You mm -hmm. know, we're happy for you, you know? And if it's not this, because this is not an easy path. So oh. if this is not for you, we don't, chastise you we don't you know we don't belittle you we don't we don't do any of that we celebrate you um so it's always you know the outsiders looking in that um come with preconceived notions or or the notion that what i do is the the only way you know and those are the people that you may have an issue with but in in terms of of the kids because um um i founded a youth of youth program 
Um, I've, I've seen several different uh, points of view coming from, coming from uh, my kids. Um, many of them are raised in the Lukumi tradition, but it, the program is open to all kids. So, you know, we get different points of view. Um, they're not always the, the most accepting, even when they're mm -hmm. raised, you know, kids are kids. So they're going to have questions. They're going to, you know, especially, um, the age that I get them, um, our programs for kids from 13 to 20, um, it's that age where they're supposed to question. They're supposed to challenge. That's what they do, you know? And mm -hmm. so we meet them head on and we answer questions and, you know, um, and if we can't answer them, we kind of guide them to where they can get the correct answers from. So we we kind of expect that and we actually welcome it um, because it, it leads to more conversation, you know, and that's the most important thing. Um, the other thing that um, I love about being able to do this kind of work is that it builds trust. And that's one of the key mm. things that, that we focus on. Um, and I think that by interacting, by going to temples, by going to uh, speaking with people from different traditions and different cultures and different faiths, we will start to trust one another just in these conversations. Because a lot of it is simply a lack of understanding, a lack of trust, mis misgot you know, uh, uh, bad information. Yeah. And so when we actually sit down and talk, I don't mind if you're staring. I don't because I will correct you. If you if you get disrespectful, then we'll we'll deal with that as well. Mm. But it's not it's not like oh you better not or you know we don't we don't take it as as that. We take it as a way to educate, you know, and especially for kids because kids are jerks, right. you know. Love them. Got three of my own. <laughs> you know, but kids are kids, and it's our job as adults, as educators, as religious leaders to guide them. And so if they're if they're being disrespectful or out of pocket, then, you know, it's it's part of our role to help them not do that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, I appreciate that. And, but and your to, patience and sensitivity. Mohan, yeah. Beautiful point. So I, I, I couldn't resist myself adding to to that particular point is because I tell my peers, my age group, when they complain about, hey, they, we are, let's say you move to a new neighborhood. And when we moved, people. I'm almost here, close to 50 years in the U.S. And uh, when we all, I mean, literally people have told us, there goes the neighborhood. So mm. literally. So that is the kind of welcome we got. Now they are friends. Mm. So I tell my peers or my, my next generations, you, we, you moved here. It's your responsibility to reach out and be uh, and say and explain yourself, inform about you, get rid of misconceptions, and that is. I if Henry brought somebody here to learn, he's doing me a big favor. Is that's how I think of it. So it is mm -hmm. very very important because the, nobody asked us to move here. We chose to move here, so mm -hmm. therefore it's our responsibility to be part of it, and mm -hmm. and explain and inform. So yeah, and of course that's. This is a I know. I know. huge a huge issue that we can only just touch on now, but I just want to flag that Mohan, as a member of an immigrant community that chose to move to the U.S., your experience, I think, is a little different. Mm -hmm. yeah, Loriwa's ancestors who came here in a very different way, or um, Midge and Ray Lynn and Farina's ancestors who just been here. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, no, but I appreciate what you're saying, that, and I think the same is true for members of any minority religious or cultural community i don't it's not fair to put a burden on you that it's like your job to educate the rest of the world but on the other hand i i think it is important for all communities to just kind of step up be open be part of the conversation um well thank you and uh, there's like 10 more things that i would love to say <laughs> but i think we're we're, we're out of time for this section. And I'm actually really excited to continue the conversation with this full group because I also have seen all kinds of parallels between what Ia Oloriwa and, and uh, Mohan Uncle are saying and what Ray Lynn and Midge were saying earlier. And it's fascinating to see, you know, these two very urban, like New York City religious leaders and these two uh, tribal leaders in Oklahoma, like they share a lot of concerns. So I'm excited to 
Tiffany, you want to come back on and, and sort of bring us all together? And thank you again, Oloriwa and Mohan. Much appreciated. Yeah, thank you. This has been um, an excellent conversation and it's been so wonderful to hear from all of you. And, um, you know, like Henry, I see so many of these kind of connecting threads. And I feel like what I hear everyone kind of talking about in, in, a, in a different way is, um, you know, the, the importance of being able to control, or, or at least if not control, have a say um, about the narrative about you and recognizing that if you don't get to have a say, somebody else is going to try to define you and create a narrative and tell people who you are. And so, um, you know, how do you find ways to make sure that those narratives actually um, represent you and the ways you want to be represented, that you actually recognize yourself in the in those narratives and um, that they're respectful. And I hear everyone kind of talking about um, navigating that in, in, in different kinds of ways. Um, one question that I have, and I think we can also open this up to other questions um, in our group, but one question I have for all of you is, um, you know, as you've all been talking about different ways in which you've benefited from working with academics and, and also reasons why, you know, you've wanted to work with academics, um, what would you like academics to know if you're giving advice to academics who 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 see that, you know, and I think a lot of our audience for this webinar is our folks that um see the value of doing kind of community engaged work, that they also see the importance of, um, you know, not trying to tell stories for other people, but instead like working with. Um, but just because you see those, see that and, and the value of that and recognize the importance of that work doesn't mean you know how to do it well. <laughs> and so, you know, what kind of things would you like academics to know about um, things that they should keep in mind or, um, you know, when uh, trying to work with communities, community leaders, community organizations. Anyone want to go first with that? I'll jump in. So um, I think something that is important for academics and scholars um, to understand about working with tribal nations or indigenous communities is that for us, um, something that has of course been a major impact um, to us over time has been settler colonialism and colonization. And the fact that that's not something of the past, um, we still battle that every day um, with the work that we do. And, um, you know, we're, we're, we're fighting every day for our sovereignty. Um, and sometimes even for our very identities of who we are as indigenous peoples. And so um, for me, you know, I think that it's important that if you're going to engage with an indigenous community or communities or tribal nations, and we kind of already touched on this before, you have to um, learn about that community. You have to have an understanding, know the culture, know the traditions, know the history um, before you just jump in and say, hey, you know, can you do this for me? Or even, hey, can we do this together? Um, you need to know the people. And um, again, you know, that, that, that doesn't happen very often. For me, here at the Muscogee Nation and the work that I do with oral history, um, you know, I'm a Muscogee citizen and I work for the Muscogee Creek Nation, but that doesn't even give me an automatic in with our people. Mm -hmm. um, and again, because of our experiences as Muscogee and because of our trauma-based history um, and the fact that the physical, the mental, the emotional trauma does still uh, remain, you know, in, in the memories of our people today, in, in our hearts and our minds, that's not something that's ever going to leave us. Um, there is a great mistrust and the fact that over time, uh, you know, these people, these anthropologists, uh, ethnologists, historians, the fact that they've come into indigenous communities and they have, um, 
you know, placed on indigenous peoples, uh, very inappropriate means of research and study. Uh, it's done a lot of damage and in some cases, you know, irreparable damage. Mm. Uh, and so there is today still a lot of trust in indigenous communities uh, regarding folks outside of the community. But even for me, uh, again, you know, as, as a Muscogee and, and someone working here for Muscogee people, um, I still have to work against those impacts of colonialism and colonization. Um, I have to work to gain people's trust. And so, you know, I kind of have some rules of, of, of thumb that I, that I follow with my work. I have to be very transparent and I have to engage in excellent communication. I have to be patient and understanding and respectful respectful of the fact that there are going to be people who are not going to want to engage uh, in my work. And um, one of the very first oral history interviews that I ever did uh, was with a younger Cherokee gentleman. We were talking about Cherokee ecological knowledge, uh, and he was sharing these things with me. And he made a statement that like literally hit me right between the eyes, and it has stuck with me ever since, and it always will. And what he said to me is knowledge is not a right, it is a privilege. And so in indigenous communities, you do have to earn the right to have um, an indigenous person, potentially an elder, share their knowledge with you, share their teachings with you. And so I just wanted you know, to clarify that, that sometimes even for, for those of us who are a part of these communities, um, because of our histories and the things that have happened to us uh, in the past, you know, we still have those challenges and uh, we still have to overcome those things. But again, be respectful of the fact that, that, that not, not all Indigenous peoples are going to want to participate um, yeah. in whatever the project is that you're, you're trying to do. Mm -hmm. So I'll stop there. I know um, since I've gone back to school, I'm very fortunate to be in a program where you can get credit for life experience. And um, I wrote, one, one of the things I do is um, I sing traditional African music um, in ceremony. Um, and the way that you get college credit is that you have to find a course that is comparable to what it is that you're trying to get credit for, which I thought was bananas, but whatever. Um, and so I found this uh, uh, course to become a cantor at Berkeley College. And I said, oh, that's perfect. You know, so I combined the two and um, wrote, you know, wrote the paper. Um, and it was called the Afro-Cuban Apone, which is the title with Apone is like a cantor. And I write the paper and the person that was assigned to uh, review the paper wouldn't give me credit. Uh, he said that I didn't write about jazz in Cuba. I didn't write about salsa in Cuba. And I said, but that's not what I was, what my essay was about. My essay was about this very particular thing. Um, and I actually had to fight to, to get the credits. Um, it struck me very much when Raylan said that she, um, her paper would not have been accepted if she were not in collaboration with this PhD. And so my, my very, very, very um, edited comment to academics <laughs> would be all knowledge is not in books. All knowledge is not in school. I wrote about the difference between UCLA and UCLA. University of California at Los Angeles and the university on the corner of Lenox Avenue. They both, <laughs> you're not going to learn what anybody learns on the corner of Lenox Avenue at UCLA, and you're not going to learn what is taught at UCLA on the corner of Lenox Avenue, but they're both important. They're both important and they're both significant and they're both correct and they both deserve respect. So to not be able to have your paper given credit or acknowledged because you don't have letters behind your name is ridiculous. For this 
this professor, this PhD to judge me. I've been singing this music for over 40 years. You don't have the qualifications. You don't have the qualifications to judge what I'm telling you. All you can do is listen and learn, period, end of story. Give me my credits. Matter of fact, you should give me more than what I asked for because my knowledge is way more than you will ever get, even if you started today. So don't try me, right? So if you don't have this idea of learning is not just in this one bubble, then you don't have the right to even approach anyone. If you don't have the, the intellect to be open to other people's experiences, you don't have the right to do this. If you're not able to do that, then you should just sit somewhere else, write your book or whatever. Because I even wondered um, uh, the grad students that wrote their papers, who's grading those papers? If they're not talking to the Muscogee um, people, who, who is saying, yes, this is correct, this is correct. If you're not talking to the people, who's grading this? You're just going by some book that some white man wrote when he showed up in the 1500s, that's it? Don't you want more? Don't you want more? Don't you, as an anthropologist, as a, you know, whatever um, title you're going for, you should want more. You should want to talk to the people that live the lives that you are interested in studying. And you should understand that it's important, not just what's in the books, but what the people live, what the culture is, the people that experience this daily, are the, is where your research should be. Yeah. Yeah, you know, Laura, first of all, can I, I just love that that was the edited version. The unedited version, you're going to go seriously Brooklyn on us. <laughs> um, but I appreciate your passion about it. <laughs> One thing I just want to flag, I really appreciate how you are acknowledging that both UCLA's matter. You know, that academic knowledge, I think, and I don't want to suddenly sound kind of defensive as an anthropologist. Oh, no, no, no. I love but, being back in school. Yeah, I yeah, love yeah. It. Totally. And the academic knowledge, I think, has something really valuable to add. I think academics have a particular skill set that can help to put community knowledge into larger contexts, into conversation across communities, um, can bring something unique and, and valuable to the conversation. Um, but, it, but amen though, you know, if you're not interested in actually talking to the people and learning from the people that you're writing about, then your academic knowledge is not going to have much legs. Well, I also feel like when you're doing that, if you're writing something and like I said earlier, it's, it's the book, it's, it's what's available. Like you were mentioning there just a minute ago of, um, people want to learn about the world. They want to learn about, um, you know, these different communities, whether they are religious, they are native nations, they are different peoples of how collectives, you know, of how, how they identify. And so they Google something, they look it up, they go to the library, or they try to learn the way that they're taught through these, you know, widespread school systems. And then if they find, you know, that book written by somebody who never even talked to the people, it's this kind of perpetuation of violence, actually, of, um, you know, silencing the people themselves. And that's what I think this conversation is about, is saying, no, you can't silence the people that it's it's their history you're telling, or, or it's their you know, st stories and knowledge that these different, you know, academics or some who call themselves, right, public intellectuals, they're doing work that is for these public audiences. I think that's actually violent. It's not just uh, a mistake or something, because though that's what people will have access to when they're looking and they think, oh, I'm good now. I don't I don't need to actually talk to the people and understand what they value, what they want known about their people. Even if um, there's some knowledge, as you all were talking about, especially with the sacred, how important that is to many peoples of what is appropriate to share and what isn't, that's another big part of all this too. Absolutely. And another part is who gets paid? Yeah, who, who gets credit? <laughs> And who, gets, who, gets money and, who gets the yeah. money? Who yeah. gets the grants? Hello? Yeah. <laughs>
you're, that's part of the violence. That is part of the violence. You're you're literally taking money out of the uh, hands and the and the lands and the homes uh, of the people who deserve the credit and you know who who need what you're giving out to people who because they are academics or scholars or whatever can write a grant and you know get money for studying me. How dare you? Can I just add very brief, just to come back to Tiffany's question of advice for academics who are trying to do this work, honoraria are a good way to respect people's time and contributions. And I know granted, like someone who's watching this, if you're at a public university and you got zero budget, you know, I'm not talking about giving people a thousand dollars to be on a panel discussion, but you know, if you're asking someone to come to your your campus and like sit in your class and talk to your students and it's gonna take them an afternoon. They're committed to that work for a thousand reasons of their own and they should be paid for it. There's also co-authorship. Raylan, I saw you unmuted and then Mohan, but yeah. Did you wanna add anything, Raylan? I saw you were unmuted. Yes, I just agree. Yeah, I agree a hundred percent about that. Sorry, that was going to be one of my recommendations also was that um, that there's some kind of compensation, you know, for people's time um, because, you know, you are, <clears throat> which, like you said, the honorary doesn't have to be that much. But, you know, the other piece of advice I would have is that we hear that people are afraid to talk to us or they don't know who to talk to. And so we really, you know, encourage just send a letter or reach, you know, send a uh recall you know we're not um that scary hopefully and um you know and even if you don't get a response the first time you might have sent it to the wrong person or something so you know um try again you know it, it don't, doesn't feel like you're hounding or pressure you know uh, but also as academics be mindful of how can this benefit this community that you want to work with because for, for many proposals that come in are all about me, my research, my research question, my study, and it, and that kind of sets the wrong tone. And I think to, to be able to really do collaborative research, you have to be, think about the other community and how it could benefit them, you know, um, because we, we are not going to really get involved in anything that doesn't benefit our people and our community that there's some kind of value. Um, and so I think those are the two two main points of advice is don't be afraid to reach out. Don't be afraid to follow up. Make sure you compensate people for their time and to, um, like like everyone said, have an open mind and, and to really be considerate of the community and um, that you're not asking them to do this, you know, emotionally labor intensive work um, for free or for with no benefit to their people. Uh, if I may, next. I have something else I'd like to mention just uh, for, you know, people's knowledge. Um, at the University of Tulsa, this uh, is the first school year that they have uh, rolled out a new minor program. It's my understanding that this is the, it's the only program like it in the, in the United States. And the, the name of the program is um, Historical Trauma and Transformation. And so uh, what they have done, they, they received an NEH grant to get this minor off the ground. It's two professors at the university that um, created this uh, minor program. And I've been very impressed uh, with the work that they have done, even in the way that they approached uh, the minor and, and the release of the minor. And last summer, uh, Raylan and I had the opportunity to be a part of what they call the Summer um, Training Institute. And so any of their professors who wanted to teach within this minor program had to go through uh, several weeks of this training institute. And the training institute was made up of community people. Um, so they brought in people from the different diverse communities uh, here locally. And so Ray Lynn and I were there representing the Muscogee Nation and they had some folks from the black communities and, and other communities um, who came and gave presentations um, and really an opportunity for us to go and teach these professors about our history. 
Um, and so it's just, it's a fantastic uh, program, I think. And again, this is the, the first year that they've rolled that out. And I would encourage any uh, academic to, um, to check that out um, at Tulsa University and, and, and see what they're doing with that. So a very significant um, project and minor program for their students there at the university. Mohan, you had you had something on your mind before. Yeah, I just a um, couple of things. First, I want to thank Mitch Dellinger for adding to my arsenal of words trauma-based history, which I can easily relate to my colleagues out here. Uh, second, Ia uh, Oloriva, um, if she didn't go first, I was going to let her ask her because I knew her a few minutes longer than the rest of you, so I'm biased for her to go first. But anyway, two pieces of advice in my mind from the uh, for, for the academics. Number one would be very similar to what Ia said, uh, which is should go below the words you read, the words to hear. If, if you're talking, reading about Hinduism, underneath those words are one billion Hindus with beating hearts and pulse and have the brain of their own. Let's say 50% of them are truly practicing. That's 500 million people. They can't all be stupid to follow a faith. So, so uh, understand and teach that to the students saying that Respect people, that's number one. You have to respect what for what they are and so forth. Second would be my, uh, I have a sort of a, shall we say selfishness in here. It's non-monetary. It's more like academics will be doing a lot of service to pe me, people educate, religious educators like me in nonprofit. Uh, I'm a volunteer by the way. And by inviting us to forums like this, which reaches a whole lot more number people. And this is the first, not the, one of the few times, Henry is the only one who is giving me that opportunity. All the academics say thank you and I never see them until next year when they bring the group. So there's no connection in between me and them for the entire year and then they call. I say, sure, you're welcome because that's what we will do. Anyway, so to invite these people and it's not, again, it's non-monetary. Money is always good, but non-monetary. Uh, uh, remember us when you're putting together forums. Mohan, can I just say, I just really appreciate you saying, to be blunt, like thanking me for this opportunity, because I'll be honest, like when I approached you and Ia Aloriwa, I was like, oh, there's this kind of like wacky academic webinar that I hope you guys can do. It's not really like religious diversity education. I don't know if you'll be into it. And I felt that whole kind of same kind of anxiety in my head of like, I don't want to impose on them or, or like drag them into something that's just my agenda and not theirs. You know, so to hear you say, to thank me for you know inviting you into this space, I, I I'm I really am touched to hear that, and I appreciate it. My privilege. Absolutely, I agree. Your treatment and your respect um, and acknowledgement um, has gone a long way. Uh, I don't think I've ever said no to you. <laughs> and you I can. I, I, Not I, that, I, that I'm encouraging you to. I don't know that. <laughs> Picture me not knowing how to say no, but <laughs> <laughs> I don't, I doubt that uh, unless uh, there's a conflict in schedule that, uh, that I would ever say no. <laughs> and if I can ask a question of my native uh, folks. So part of uh, what, what local me people do in preparation for initiation is uh, we do investigation into the initiate's ancestry. And sometimes we are told to do specific things for those ancestors. When my grandchildren uh, were initiated, we had to uh, do a lot of stuff. And they were initiated in my home. One of the things that came up was that we had to acknowledge uh, that this is native land. And I was like, wow, this is new. I, you know, um, and so I reached out to a few people, but I found that 
the I live in Brooklyn, New York, um, and it's Lenape, Muncie, and Canarsie uh, nations that 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 lived on this land. And the only people that I was able to get information on uh, is the Thunder Mountain Lenape people in Pennsylvania. I had to get a flag to acknowledge them. Like it was this whole thing. And I was like, I have no idea what I'm doing. So I'm hoping that if not you, you can help me reach out to people that might know more so I can do this honoring that we need to do properly. Yeah. Thanks for sharing that. I think um, there is a play that recently was shown in New York by a Cherokee playwright named Mary Catherine Nagel, and she worked with Lenape on it um, because there are a lot of stories that um, Raylan and Midge, I think, were referring to as well. Um, trauma, cycles of violence that uh, different peoples go through, and, and that includes uh, forced removals. And so it's it's so sensitive on multiple layers, right, of stolen knowledge, stolen stories, but stolen land, too, right, right? Um, and living that. And so this play that Mary Catherine Nagel wrote is called uh, Manahata. And uh, it's based on research that she did um, and work with Lenape peoples. So I recommend that. And um, there's more resources out there, I think. Um, that's why, yeah, I, I love Native American studies. I didn't get to mention that I teach at the University of Oklahoma in mm -hmm. the Native American studies department now. I'm currently working there. So please reach out, anyone. Um, and I think that's important, too, of... There's so many different peoples and this opportunity to learn with respect, humility, understanding, and empathy is most important. You know, just anyone, if they can, it might be hard for them, you know, to pause and think, you know, how would I like someone to learn about me or my ancestors or my grandparents and, you know, if it's like people want to share, but there's certain things and ways they want that done. And I think that's something um, that's so important in all this. Thank you. Thank you. And we'll look her up. Thank you all. I realize that we are um, reaching the end of our time together. And I feel like we could keep talking a lot longer. This has been a wonderful conversation. And I think, you know, what one thing I just want to mention that's been part of our grounded knowledge project that this larger project is this idea that um, many academics are increasingly realizing that the ways that we've been trained as academics, you know, the kinds of norms we've been socialized into in the academy, um, just reproduce things like colonization, empire, oppression, and we don't necessarily want to devote our lives to that kind of work, right? And so with that, like, how do we rethink our assumptions about knowledge, about relationships, about expertise, about authority? And I think this conversation with you all has been so illuminating and has just really sort of reinforced the importance of, um, I think academics need to learn to sort of step away from a lot of their assumptions about what, it, about being an expert and, you know, being in a position of authority, learn to listen, you know, really be in conversation, really be in community, um, and recognizing too that, you know, sometimes that also just takes a bit of time, takes a bit of work, you know, as you said, Raylan, maybe you have to send a few emails, but, you know, to have that kind of patience to really build those relationships. And I think you all have, have shown just so wonderfully, like, just like the value of um, being able to really work in, in partnership and in solidarity with communities. And so thank you all so much for all your time and um, for all your insights. Um, this has been fantastic. And thank you everyone for joining us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank Take you. care, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Nice to meet you. So, so nice to meet nice you. Nice to meet everybody. Bye.